and welcome to our Palo Alto studios. I just flew in from Vegas where we're still on the ground interviewing people as well. Uh, we have a great CUBE conversation going on here exclusively as part of our coverage of AWS's reInvent. I'm Rob Stretchy, Managing Director with the CUBE Research. And in this session, we'll explore what organizations that are using AWS for the hyperscale cloud are looking to do when it comes to getting a return on investment on their data and how AI most certainly is playing a major role in this. Today, I'm joined by Debo Detta, who's the VP of Engineering for AI at Nutanix. Welcome, Debo. Thank you uh, for having me here on your show. Yeah, so I, I think, again, there's so much exciting news coming out of Las Vegas this week. I'm, I'm, I'm overwhelmed by the hundreds of announcements. I think there, there was something like 40 different uh, yeah. launches or something like that, some really exciting stuff. But you know, getting started, let's kind of take a step back and look at the, the state of the market because I think a big piece of this is people are really trying to understand how cloud is tracking and not in just cloud, but actually cloud operating models and the adoption of those services. One of the things that has been an inhibitor to building AI in the cloud has been the fact that over 84% of data that organizations want to use in their models is on premises. That leaves most organizations to have to move or copy data to cloud if they are planning to train or do inference. So let me bring you into the conversation, Debo, because I, I think, again, you know, Nutanix really is taking a different approach. I mean, you guys started out on premises and have gone to the cloud. Uh, you've had, you know, again, started out with st kind of a storage framework, then into uh, virtual machines, into containers, and now into AI. Kind of give people a little bit of a perspective of your background and what you're up to at Nutanix, because you have a really unique role there. Yes, sir, of course. Um, so I, I lead all of AI engineering and Nutanix, which means I do two things. So I uh, lead all the engineering for Nutanix Enterprise AI that we can go into, which is part of GPT in a box solution. And also, I have a dual role uh, to you know, kind of ensure that Nutanix can be made more efficient with the use of generative AI. Yeah, I, I think that to me is the real exciting thing because you're, you're sipping your own champagne as Absolutely. it would be. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I think that, you know, again, folks might only have known uh, Nutanix, you know, from the hyper-converged infrastructure market, uh, kind of give a snapshot of where you, you know, where things have changed for Nutanix in the past, yeah. you know, past couple of years here. Sure. Actually, um, I'll give you a uh, quick overview of how we've morphed. So we we were a hyper-converged infrastructure company, then we morphed to a cloud platform company, a hybrid cloud platform company, and now we are morphing into a cloud-native company. You to you know manage modern apps, including AI, of course, and all the data that enterprises have under their control. And uh, in this transition, what we've noticed is that people are really embracing for the modern apps, AI, uh, the you know the AI agents, two major things. One is that they would like to have a consistent platform for running all their apps, including uh, you know their AI apps. And the second thing is that they would like to have a consistent view of managing their data. Yeah, I, I think that to me fits really well with a lot of the announcements that are going on and how really, I think, organizations that I've been talking to over the course of the week in Vegas, really, it, it, I think the announcements that you've had, especially around Nutanix, you know, Enterprise AI, mm -hmm. uh, really fit well with a lot of the talk that's been going on down at reInvent. Kind of want to take us through what Nutanix Enterprise AI is and really how it fits into that ecosystem because I think people will be a little bit surprised if they haven't heard of it before. Nutanix Enterprise AI is a new offering from Nutanix which is part of our GPT in a box overall solution where our goal is to land our customers' generative AI workloads on Nutanix. Now, if you think about, if you double click what's happening there, one of the key uh, um, you know, components of that generative AI application development lifecycle, whether you do agents or RAG, is inference. So we are uh, focused in uh, Nutanix Enterprise AI on how to do inference really well for the enterprise. And the way the product works is very simple. 
um, we simplify the entire life cycle of inference for our customer. So a customer can go and choose any model from Hugging Face or from the NVIDIA catalog and then deploy the model very easily with a couple of uh, button clicks. And what you have is a model endpoint running with an API in front that talks like OpenAI. And with that, customers can now build their chatbots against those. And we give them enterprise-grade control, like our back. And also, uh, you know, they can access these models with access tokens, so it's safe, secure. So essentially, what we've given them is simplicity, and we've given them control, and we've given them predictable price instead of per token-based pricing. And what's new right now is that we have extended this whole offering on EKS. And that's what's exciting to me and to our customers. Yeah, and, and for those who don't know, it's Amazon's AWS Elastic Kubernetes service. Uh, we, I got to interview Barry Cooks, who was the, the lead of that, and I, I think they're doing some really neat things there as well that are very complementary to exactly what you're talking about. And I think, I, I, I think it's actually really a very interesting how these two things have kind of come together at this point in time, because a lot of people are trying to figure out how do I do inference? Because they're looking at it and going, yes, I have to train or fine tune the models and kind of mm -hmm. put guardrails around it, but I'm really, a, a, you know, I'm really worried about uh, data exfiltration and the security that goes around that. I, I'm sure that there's some interesting use cases that you guys have been using internally on, with your other hat on. So what yes. kind of help people understand? Because I think that's a real key to a lot of organizations where to get started. And Nutanix has always been good about having that easy button to get started, so. Absolutely, so um, when we looked inside, uh, you know, as uh, to our own use cases, which was pretty much the same, similar stuff that we heard from customers, we found that there is a need to improve uh, our support experience. So we, what we did is internally is to create a support bot, we called it support GPT, which would help our own SREs get to information faster so that they could uh, give our customers delightful support that we are known for. And the set, another use case that we are currently working on is how do we make our software engineers more efficient? While we still are in the early phases of that, but we, we've uh, figured out many several use cases in the entire software development lifecycle where we can use generative AI to move things faster. So I, I think what's really interesting, again, you, you wearing these both hats, uh, you see there and you're, you're sipping your own champagne. So what are some of the internal use cases that you see Nutanix really diving into that you're using internally around generative AI? Yeah, you know, uh, it's uh, been so exciting as a journey internally, right? Uh, we've seen several use cases in almost every part of Nutanix we see a use case but we prioritized and we picked up two use cases in the last year or so. The one is to create a chat bot internally to help our SREs find information really quickly and then provide the delightful uh, support that uh, Nutanix is uh, known for. The second use case is a little bit more early, but we are using generative AI to kind of help our developers go faster, which means it's not just the code generation, but the entire life cycle, which includes testing, uh, code understanding, code review, and also you know code explainability, and things like that. And so I think uh, this is just the beginning. We are uh, finding out that there's so many use cases, it's just that we have to prioritize them and make sure that these are of high quality, the use cases that we build, because one of the biggest challenges in building internal use cases or external use cases is data quality and the ability to actually have good outcomes and results from these uh, you know, data science experiences. Yeah, I, I love those ideas that help people really focus on where they can get started, through examples that people are being successful with. And I mean, obviously sipping your own champagne and helping your uh, software developers be more efficient in their production of code and 
and as well as your SREs, your site reliability engineering team. I, I think that is you know, key to organizations and pretty much transferable to almost every company in the world. That's correct, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I, I think that was a big conversation around that is how do you do that but keep your own style, your own code base so that people become more efficient with Nutanix's way of building software versus just generalized or, and also I, I would assume that this helps uh, Nutanix from a perspective that you can control the data that's in there so you don't have to worry about other IP infringement or anything like that's that. That's correct. So that's a very tricky uh, um, problem to solve actually. And you've hit the nail on the head because um, I mean, I know a lot of people are generating code today, so we've taken a very conservative stance on not generating any code that ships to our customer because we um, want to make sure that it is completely you know, conflict-free in terms of intellectual property. So what we do is we use um, generative AI in the other parts of the software development lifecycle, like code understanding, code review, where you know, we are not actually inserting uh, generated code. We are still not there yet. Well, I, I think that's a great takeaway for customers that are out there and organizations that are saying, hey, you know, I want to use this. And in fact, it, it's funny, I was talking to a couple developers this week, just earlier this week, and that was a big piece of what they were looking at was the fact that they were, they were not trying to generate code per se out of that, but they were trying to figure out, okay, where do I get started? Do I start with, you know, code review or QA or what have you. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a great lead into there. Um, now, I don't, I don't want to bury the lead here because it is reInvent Week and things of yeah. that nature. You know, why was it important to yourselves and to your customers to really uh, allow Nutanix Enterprise AI to run on top of EKS? Well, that's a very good uh, question. So we actually realized that many of our customers are also customers of AWS EKS, and they're using EKS for running all their workloads. So you want to typically co-locate your AI, uh, you know, where your other workloads are, where your data is. And the other thing is uh, uh, what we realized is most of our customers want a common operating model. They want consistency. So most of our customers, including ourselves, we are hybrid in terms of where our computation is, where our data is, and where the AI is going to run, right? So um, when you're running um, uh, AI on-premise, as well as on AWS, you need to be consistent in terms of your tooling, your user interface of the tools that you use, and that way your enterprise IT can, ad administrator can become the new AI admin and have a consistent view of how to manage the entire sprawl. Yeah. And that's one of the key reasons why we did it. Yeah, I, I can see, because again, we were at KubeCon and we, we talked to you guys at KubeCon as well, and I, I think uh, that was almost a month ago now. It feels, yes. like, it feels like yesterday, but yesterday was that's a still a bit. Yeah, I know, but when we start to look at it, uh, there's platform engineering and people where, it used to be VM admins, storage admins, and network admins, now they're all coming together again as these platform engineers wearing kind of different hats. And oh, by the way, there's ML ops and AI ops. And LLM ops. Yes, and LLM ops. I mean, there's ops everywhere. Um, I, I would say that that has to be also a focus to your point of why because, uh, I mean, with 84% of the data being on-prem, it, it seems to me that's, that's why you would want to do that and have that data so you can go and build your models and train your models, but when you're doing the inference, you want it closer to the people who are actually doing, doing the work. Yes, so um, we believe that inference needs to be done closer to where the decisions have to be made. So when you train the model, you have to run that workload closer to the data where you're uh, which you want to use for your training or fine tuning. So we find that uh, for most of our use cases and our customers, that's also a, a very key thing. They want inference to be done all the way to the edge in certain use cases. And, and some of our customers are running most of the things um, in the data center and they'll do it in the data center and then they have a hybrid, so they're running it in cloud. So for a spectrum of use cases, you want a consistent operating model a simplified view of inference from your from the edge all the way to the cloud that covers your entire gamut of installation of your enterprise IT. 
Yeah, in, in fact, that came up. We were having a conversation we, as analysts got to have a conversation with Matt Garman yesterday, mm -hmm. and that came up as a big, uh, a big ask for customers is that really how do you bring AI everywhere, not just all centralized? That's because good. not everybody's, in, in fact, I would say the vast majority are not trying to go and build uh, the next chat GPT themselves to, to productize that as an offering. They're using chat as a way to, like you said, enhance their customer service experience, their SREs, to, so they can get to the answers in code faster. Is that kind of where you see kind of the center of gravity of where you're aiming this solution at? So uh, that's a interesting question. I, I feel that we will start at uh, you know simple use cases like what we just talked about: customer support, generation of content, whether it's code or uh, you know, PowerPoint like uh, presentations or uh, even documents, right? And also private document search. A lot of our use cases are around uh, these issues and of course security. Everybody wants to use generative AI to be more secure. But that's, I think, just the beginning. That's like phase one. In phase two, uh, I believe that we'll see a lot of semi-autonomous agents, AI agents, who will do certain tasks on their own and the and I think that's going to be uh, that's my personal. I was going to say, is this where you're going with the with the product, or where you see the product going over, say, the next twelve months? Is agentic? No, so I think we have to support agentic uh, workloads. But with this uh, Nutanix AI product, what we realized is, the more people do agents, the more people do RAG and other use cases. There's going to be one constant thing: the more people will, uh, the more inference you will need. So we want to first give our customers delightful experience in just doing really high quality inference and give, give our customers the choice to run it anywhere, on EKS, on premise, at the edge, and also the, a variety of models, whether it's NVIDIA NIM or whether it's models on hugging face like Llama 3.2. Like it's important for customers to know that they can have one simple, consistent operating model for running models. And then, you know, with the product, they can exactly see who's using which model, like the admins. They have full visibility, full control, and I think that's important in the enterprise. Uh, it's super important, I, I, I would say, because you want to understand how it's being utilized, and I, I think, again, it's, it's really important to bringing it back, that full circle of development, yes. as you start to iterate through and you get that flywheel going. So Exactly. Uh, this, is, this has been great. Uh, I know people can go and find more out at Nutanix.com slash AI. Great landing page there. I, I went and checked it out uh, after the yeah, launch. Thank you. Uh, so, you know, thank you for coming on board. And thank I really appreciate you coming here. And, uh, you know, again, it's, it's been crazy with all of the announcements. And I, I think what you guys are doing really ties up with, really well with what's going on at reInvent this week. Thank you very much for having me here again. Yep. And thank you for watching this episode of theCUBE live from Palo Alto and Las Vegas, where we're breaking it all down for you. We got everybody on there from Andy Jassy all the way to the heads of all of the different services, plus all of the partner ecosystem like Nutanix, who's building and integrating in to give that customer a better experience. So stay tuned for more live from uh, Las Vegas and from here at the studio and from some remote as well. We'll see you soon.